So let me start off with Mr. Shane. You've played in the Nigeria ICT ecosystem for quite a number of years. And if I'm talking about the chief information officers of organizations, I think you would like to, I would say, you, let, let me use you as a touch for that. Quite a number of information uh, officers and technology officers of many organizations in Nigeria want to deliver on some of these required of, of data services for consumers and even for uh, their clients and even for their organizations. But quite a number of them are having issues with funding. You get to your CFO, you get to your <laughs> your accountant, and in the case of we have this new technology, let's make use of this, we have this, and they frown upon it. Quite a number of CIOs are having that issue, which I personally believe is one of the reasons that is pulling the adoption of digital transformation back. What are your thoughts and what do you think can be done for CIOs to be able to use these evolved technologies for service delivery? Okay, um, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is She Akinde, I'm the founder of Hyperspace uh, Technologies. Uh, so, well, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so. Um, she asked a very um, thought-provoking question about CIOs and um, getting funding for some of these things. And the problem is, a lot of us in the te technology space, we often, we're so keen into the technology that we do not sort of get the business value. It's almost as if we're hinged on that technology. We think that that technology is the be-all and the end-all. Forgetting that technology itself Anytime you deploy any kind of technology, it serves three primary purposes. The organization is looking at it from the perspective of, does it make us money? So if we deploy this technology, is it going to allow us to have more customers? Is it going to allow us to get more business? The second thing is, does it save us money? So if we deploy this technology, are we going to save money? Are we, is it going to stop us from, you know, of course, you know, during the early days of, um, um, people digitizing in terms of getting uh, personal computers for the organization. You know, imagine that time when people were coming from you know, days of doing things manually. Uh, you had to justify computerization in you know, some of these organizations. And part of it is you have to sell to them how it is saving you money. And the third thing, which is what we often lack in our space, is selling them on the idea of it solving the problem. So the CEO wants to know, the CFO wants to know, is it solving a fundamental problem for us? You know, everybody's talking about, you know, deploying this technology, you know, using these servers, using this equipment. Um, when we read, you know, we're technical people, and as soon as something new, something flashy comes out, we think we want to deploy it, but not keen into the fact that those, is this really solving a fundamental problem, you know, for us, which is, you know, a, a, a question we have to ask ourselves, even in terms of you know, this data center, deploying service data center, and, you know, when you see some organizations, you actually, when you do some kind of audit and analysis of them, you find out that sometimes they, they even really do not need to deploy certain things, you know, to data center. Back in the day, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, data center was an alien concept in that people would rather have resident data on their own equipment. So, apart from probably things like uh, hosting your website in a, in, a, in a separate server, a lot of the infrastructure you need was usually, you know, uh, uh, built around the confines of the organization, which also saved a lot of money for those, you know, organizations. But now, we're saying that uh, people have to move to the cloud, people have to move to, and when you move to the cloud, I, I, that's why I like this, uh, this forum called DISC, the Data Center Infrastructure Security and Cloud. When you move to the cloud, there are a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. Now, one of it is the third one, which is security. It is very, very, very paramount. I'm sure we've all seen in the news, you know, how even in Microsoft, you know, as big as they are, 
were sort of hacked by these uh, midnight uh, blizzards, these Russian hackers. What if, so imagine a situation where in Microsoft, and it took them, they, they hacked into the server in November. Microsoft didn't find out until January uh, to, uh, to 12, then they reported in January 19, and those guys are still using the same information now. So think about the, the you know, now bring it, bring it home. Think about how a local um, uh, CIO is going to justify to, to his CFO or to CEO that, oh, we need to move to the cloud. How are you going to do this security? How are you going to prevent, you know, what are the tools you're going to use? So those are some of the challenges. That's what we often find. It's often a joke when we meet as well. That it's easy for the CMO, the chief marketing officer, to go to the MD and say, look, we need 20, you know, um, uh, private chiefs for our marketing team. You know, we need them to go to the market. Because the CEO can is easily see what those things are. So if you buy 20, and they, they give it, it's quantitative. So CIOs also have to be quantitative based. That means that you have to say, by deploying this infrastructure, by deploying these services, by moving to the cloud, by spending this amount of money, this is number one, what we are saving the organization in terms of bottom line. This is how it is enabling us to get more customers. And then this is the kind of problem that is solved. Until we do that, I do not think that the CEOs and the CFOs are going to release as much funds. So that's my take on that. Thank you very much. Any thoughts, um, Emmanuel? Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Emmanuel Zeule. I'm the co-founder at API, API Century. So at API Century, we are next the power of AI and advanced computing to combat cyber attacks. And uh, that's we've been doing quite a while now as a company. So there's something, I just to throw more light on what uh, I could just say is uh, in the space, We've seen a situation where uh, CIOs or CTOs or even organizations, they are uh, reacting to cybersecurity matters instead of being proactive, right? Because you see the case of, oh, we don't, we don't want to pay attention to cybersecurity protocols until we are hacked. And that actually has been a problem. Yes, companies, uh, management stakeholders want to invest more in sales, they want to invest more in other uh, other assets. But investing in smart security is key because from statistics, businesses in Africa, the position to lose over 100 billion dollars in the coming year to cyber attacks, right? So it's key for us to start paying attention to cyber security as the, the case may be because. Yes, we understand that it's not bringing in money as it were consigned as released to the sales department. But what uh, happens when you lose money because you didn't pay attention to this? So my, my, my contribution is we should start being proactive to specific measures in our uh, institution than just being reactive. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmanuel. Um, before I go ahead, um, some whispers have come to my ears that is still not yet balanced. So I would like to call Miss Chidera Eze Okonko of um, Nigeria Data Protection Commission to join us on stage. Chidera for uh, joining us. I know you have some thoughts on what we have discussed so far. But I would like to go further down from the role of the CIOs, the CTOs, ready to make available these services for funding. I know everybody is curious as to why I started off on the money matter. The moment I mentioned money, I saw some people leaving. I know there must be some CFOs or some accountants. Because when they hear money, <coughs> they don't want to speak further. But get what money is needed in this will to move forward. Um, before I um, I go further down to cyber security in um, I want to ask Mr. Hyman because of these digital services that come, there is need for many organizations to give data of customers, of consumers of their services, not only for um, 
assessments or profiling for market purposes, but also for you know, um, evolution of products and services. And we know from HMOs to hospitals to insurance companies, quite a number of companies right now are, are bound to make use of data and are getting data. But the issue is, are they protected? Your thoughts, please. Okay. Um, thank you, Mojie. I wanted to add to the first um, discussion thread in the background, and um, um, quite frankly, one of the big problems we tech people have is the ability to sell. Um, so in IT governance, there's what is called IT business alignment, and being able to prepare sound business case to management for anything that is needed. So immediately you do not have that and you do not have um, ability to understand the business dynamics or how to sell to, um, to your management, it becomes difficult for the um, CIOs to actually communicate. Um, most times we go in a very techy manner, uh, we need to buy server, we need to um, buy ROM, RAM and all that. So being able to bring what we need down to the primary language that our business people would understand, the, CI, the, the, the CFOs and the, the CEOs, you know, is one skill that um, CIOs need to have. So away from our comfort zone of understanding uh, programming, techie, coding, algorithms and all that, we also need to go to school of business. To speak the money language. To be able to speak the money language, you know, um, that's just that. So, coming back to what you just um, are talking about now, you, you see, um, already within within the country, um, even though this has been coming from uh, outside, which actually propels the um, coming in of the GDPR, that's the General Data Protection uh, Regulation um, uh, from from, from Europe, sale of data, and that is why when it was mentioned earlier that this is the new oil, um, and this is actually supposed to be um, the new input to driving business. So if you intend to um, target customers, uh, you, you know, you go sometimes to LinkedIn and then you um, you want to you have a product that you sell to a certain class of persons. What happens is you can actually go there and then, um, based on profiling, the system is able to give you um, individuals whose attributes actually uh, align to that aspect of the market or the territory or segment um, that you actually desire. So. It's actually by the power of profile. Now, the other flip side of it, which is where we need to put more attention to, is the actual sale of data, the unauthorized sale of data. What is called digital marketing today, or what we call um, email marketing, or telephony marketing, or any of those marketing that requires salespeople to actually, um, rather than go pers person to person, to um, um, speak to them, sell one product and tell them about their services, what many do is to go to already existing data holders, acquire data from them, and then begin to now um, uh, spam, bulk, and so you begin to receive messages, you begin to receive emails, you begin to receive all manner of things from people you never had any interaction with before now. This is the unlawful part of data handling. And so, we look forward to a time when before you um, send me a mail or before you send me any information, you will have actually sought my consent. So, we already have regulation currently um, 
that talks about consent, that talks about the rights of um, uh, data uh, subjects. So, if you are not, or if you have not authorized an organization to actually um, have your data or send information to you, then um, your right has been breached. And this is what we actually preach around data protection. So it comes back to holders or hosts of this data, i.e. Um, those of us in the hosting area. Now, what do we do? Who gets access to the data? Who acquires the data? Do we have authorization to sell personal data of individuals who have not given consent to, um, for us to be able to sell? The truth of the matter is that you can actually get consent. So let's look at it this way. It's a business. And the reason why we call it the next oil is because you can approach me and then you tell me, um, I want to sell to, uh, you know, um, I want to sell your data to certain um, industries or a new business that can just come to town. I will buy your data for X amount. As long as I have given you my consent, and, uh, and I've signed up on it, then you can actually go ahead and sell my data to whichever organization. But in the absence of any of this, it still stays unlawful till today that you can acquire data from the street and then use it for any form of, uh, uh, from any form of, uh, for any form of marketing or for any form of sales. So that is exactly one big challenge that is still there. And I believe till tomorrow, even where the act have come into existence, at least in the past one year, and the regulation in the past four years, um, we still find persons who um, spam people and send them unauthorized, unauthorized SMS, unauthorized email. When you have this, you have a case. It means that your data has been breached, and you can report to the Nigerian Data Protection Commission that your data has been breached. Then investigation can happen, and if we get hold of such individual, and by the way, um, the express route to get into the Nigerian Data Protection Commission so that you can actually have um, preliminary investigations done and all that are the DPCOs. So you have the DPCOs all around you where you can first make your incidents and then you can now take it up to the commission. So that's exactly what it should look like. And um, we look forward to having a cleaner, a cleaner data environment. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Looking forward to a cleaner data environment where there is permission and permission is granted. And whatever that is being done there is allowed. Now, you have torn quite perfectly on regulation. And I come to Chida. Chida. Regulation is one of the uh, key tools that actually allows a particular market to grow. I want to ask, at uh, the Nigeria Data Protection Commission, like you mentioned, what are those things NDPC is putting in place to actually, he has said, data can be safe. So what is NDPC doing to ensure they are actually safe in terms of regulation. Thank you so much for your question. And thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel to um, give my own contributions to the subject matter. So at NEPC, what we do simply put is that we regulate the processing of personal data. And our mandate cuts across various sectors and various industries. And so uh, we're in a unique position to um, advance our mandate because we're not restricted by um, a particular sector or industry. In terms of regulation, the principal law that we implement is called the Nigeria Data Protection Act of 2023. And that act established the commission and gives the commission its powers. Um, one of the major things that I think the Nigeria Data Protection Commission is doing in terms of regulating is the, is the creation of the Data 
Protection Compliance Organization model. That's the DPCO model. And I'm sure you've been listening. So the Mr. Ivan Anya is actually the chairman of ALDAPCON. So ALDAPCON is an association of all of these um, DPCOs in Nigeria. And so the Nigeria Data Protection Commission licenses um, organizations such as law firms, audit firms, um, IT consultancy firms, yeah. and they give them a license to simply put, provide compliance as a service. So whenever you think about how do I want to comply with the Data Protection Act or you know various regulations that we come up with, the easiest way to go about that is to is to um, appoint or rather engage the services of a DPCO. So um, with this DPCO model, we're able to reach out to data controllers and data processors spread across Nigeria. You'll agree with me that we live in a country that has a... And so by leveraging on the DPCO model, we have these organizations that you can reach out to and they provide the services. And in terms of, of regulations, we're currently working on the general application and implementation guidelines. So after we passed the Data Protection Act in 2023, we held a number of sensitization and awareness um, programs and campaigns. Um, to basically let people know what data protection and privacy is all about and the issues that are surrounding it because there's not one of us, there's not one single person that is not involved in that ecosystem. You're either involved as an individual or involved as an organization. So people need to have this knowledge. And we found out that um, we're doing well, we're putting the message out there but we needed to find a way to simplify the language so that people understand what exactly are we expecting them to um, comply with, what exactly is our regulation asking them to do. And so um, if I were to break it down, I would say the first thing is that um, to, to uh, comply with the Nigeria Data Protection Act, the first thing is you need to think about your position as an organization that actually collects or processes personal information. So um, before now, a while ago, we would meet some people who are, who are patronizing data center operators and you'd ask them, you know, you realize you're a data controller or a data processor and they say, oh no, no, we we'll just store the data. And so you ask the question, so what do you think data processing means? And then they're like, uh, well, yeah, you are using the data and all that, but we're not using it, we're just storing it. But actually, data processing actually encompasses everything we need the lifespan of the data, and that includes storage. And so that makes data centers, uh, cloud service providers, you know, data controllers and processors. So they fall under the jurisdiction of our regulation. So we basically regulate that industry as well because of that data processing activity. And so the very first and the most basic thing that we expect as an obligation is that they should have a privacy policy. And this privacy policy is not something that you would draft in some kind of legal jargons and you know you make it so difficult for people to understand. It has to be easy for them to understand. Uh, when people hear there's a new law, they just want to know what does the law say we cannot do? What does it say we can do? So they just want a safe playing field for their activities. And we don't want to create a field filled with obstacles. We're not trying to make it more difficult for you know, organizations to do business. So we're all for ease of doing business. And in order to do your business, you need to let your customers know what exactly your business entails. So it's not enough to just say, okay, um, as an organization, these are the services we provide. But they need to also know that you're collecting their personal information. They need to know what this personal information means. What does it entail? You know, are you collecting their names, email, phone number, or is there something more than that? They also need to know what you're using it to do. What's the purpose, right? And all of these things have to be clearly communicated in the privacy policy. 
And so when we reach out to an organization to gauge their level of compliance with our regulations, the first thing we look at is your website. Is there a privacy policy on the website? How easy is the privacy policy to understand? The next thing we want to look at is, is there a data protection officer that has been appointed? So you can't have an organization that deals with personal data and you don't have a data protection officer. So it's funny, you go to an organization, you have a C CISO. You have someone in charge of information technology, information systems and all that. But who is actually looking at the technical and organizational measures to protect that data? So there needs to be a data protection officer. And then thirdly, you need to appoint the services of a DPCO. This is because the law actually provides that you need to perform annual compliance audit reports. So this audit is what is carried out by the DPCO. And what they are looking at is, they, they are not coming in to look at the data that you have. So we, are not, we don't really care what kind of data you are holding, because that's not within our mandate. What we want to know is that you put in place measures to ensure that the data you are collecting or processing is protected and then it's kept private. So your DPCO will help you to walk through the uh, compliance or rather the audit process. Afterwards, we will receive the audit report and then we will now you know, certify that you have complied with the law for that particular year. Um, another compliance measure is that there needs to, the organization needs to register with the commission, that's the NDPC, as a data controller or processor of major importance. So when I say of major importance, a lot of people start to think, well, I'm not of major importance. We're just, you know, we're either a startup. Yes, but, you know, it's not so much about the volume. It's also about the sensitivity. It's also about, you know, the special nature of the data that you're processing. And all of this is provided on the portal for that registration. So you may start out thinking, you know, you're not important and end up finding out that you're actually quite important. And so we need to capture these organizations within the ecosystem so that we can better regulate the ecosystem. If we know, for instance, that um, there's a lot of activity in the uh, cloud service provider industry or the data center industry, it will now inform us in terms of coming up with sectoral guidelines, for instance, that will then facilitate um, the data processing activities of that industry to now be in compliance with the, with the act. Wow, quite comprehensive indeed. So nobody must break the law <coughs> for all she has laid out and the insight she has given on what Data Protection uh, Commission is uh, doing. Um, the speakers have touched on quite a number of points and the, the key uh, part of it is CIOs need to be less technical and talk the money, money language. And uh, there is need um, for CIOs. Yes, it's good to concentrate on the technology, but also you need to also concentrate on what the CEOs and the CFOs will really understand as to why you need uh, these technologies. And <clears throat> we, 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 we understand that there is need for permission to be granted and also permission to be given. But while there are many content being generated every day, apart from your email, your phone number, content are being generated every day, every hour in Nigeria, and it needs to be stored somewhere. Hence, the data center service providers. Um, engineer Inamani, is he on? Not yet. Okay. Okay. Let me let me go for this. Okay. Okay. While we are waiting for Engineer Inamani to uh, join us, let me uh, go to Imagine Technologies. This is um, I know a lot of people are now curious. Imagine Technologies play quite a number of roles, and that's where the cloud comes in. Oh, new technology is here. Let's make use of it. But the question is, are we making use, do we even understand the ones on ground enough? 
do we have them enough? Are we absorbing too much of these innovation and technologies to make our data and the data center markets as the well, the service providers and also those that are making sure the rules and regulation are followed? So, Mr. Shea, your thoughts? Are we are we absorbing too much? Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, technology. Uh, technology is probably the only thing that you can leverage as even you know a small business or a startup you know to get to the to the next level. Just as uh, the um, mobile phone helped in you know leapfrogging the African continent to the next level, even though we didn't have you know sort of landline. So I don't. I wouldn't say we are talking you know, but I, I also think that. Um, because of the nature of some of these technologies, we often find out that technology usually, uh, adoption of this technology usually precedes something like regulation. So what you often find out is people are already using the technology before. And I, 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 a case in point I want to mention now is, yes, we're talking about you know, cloud computing and all that, but right now we now have artificial intelligence. And one of the things you find out is when you use some of these artificial intelligence products, they have biases in them because some of the data that was used to train this AI um, that we're all using, LNM, this language model, are, uh, you know, westernized. So it's always going to be difficult for you to find things that are, you know, very local. So I think going forward, probably uh, some of the data centers also need to sort of adopt um, this, uh, uh, um, this new technology. For instance, now, if, if you go to any data center in Nigeria, you can't, uh, we, we are here. Sorry to continue. I think engineer Namani is now with us. And he has um, here the challenge. Data centers need to also uh, update their service delivery in part with the service demand. Engineer Ike Namani, I can you hear us? So 
So they come into the country with the same quality of service as you would expect in any other part of the world in Nigeria because today the biggest data center providers globally are not operating in any other part of the world. So um, the data centers are being built to global standard in any other part of the world who are the ones running the bigger facilities and Nigeria. At least two of them are operating in Nigeria. So that means Nigeria today should not complain of quality of service when they come. The of uh, data centers in Nigeria as to investment. And now? Yes. Everybody wants to know how safe it is. How safe it is and the possibility of it being for the ecosystem in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank Are you hearing now? Yes, sir. Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Okay, uh, my okay. last question to you was on the challenges facing uh, data centers. And one of these uh, is the effects, apart from um, telecommunication use in uh, the data um, economy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, fortunately, with the, with the adoption of uh, technology in Africa comes about the increase in cyber attacks. Right. Because the, the, the fact that we are adopting this technology, there's also an increase in cyber attacks. So uh, our recommend, the recommendation from me will be, first of all, uh, there's need for uh, cyber security awareness, right, to make the ecosystem also safe. Because I'm not sure if you can have a 100% cybersecurity safe ecosystem because uh, hackers by the day, they evolve as well. So, but with a robust cybersecurity awareness and training, that actually will help. And, um, and of course, talent. It's very important, like uh, the other uh, colleagues said something that there will be cyber, uh, security of the cloud and security in the cloud. So there is a need for us to have talent to be able to uh, to uh, stand up and also work to ensure that these infrastructures, this ecosystem is, is safe. And of, of course, uh, one of the challenges in this ecosystem as it relates to emerging technology and cyber security is uh, the costs, the pricing. You know, sometimes you see uh, for us to deploy a force security infrastructure in our environment will be spending so much in different technology and different tools, right? So for all, we, we also advise that we, we uh, look back home, we come home to look at some technologies that has been developed in-house within the, the four walls of Nigeria. And, and I think that's where our technology came up from. Because currently, it's better in Nigeria, and we have our footprint currently in Kenya, Canada and uh, Zambia and Rwanda. So and we are able to also price in Naira as it were. So these are some things that we can put in place to ensure that uh, we have an enabling environment and people can actually accept and adopt technology in, uh, in the ecosystem. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Now still on cyber security, your thoughts on uh, secured uh, data centers like the uh, engineering that Mani has mentioned that the market is facing quite a number of challenges and one of them is the effects. But like Mr. Imana just mentioned right now, cyber security. Your thoughts on cyber security for data centers? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, the thing with uh, data centers is that what they're doing is uh, it's a, a giving us, so if, if you, it, it's like a building, so you are, what I am on a data center, I, I take for granted, I would take for granted that they have already done some of these compliance checks. They are keeping their data secure. So at my own end, if I am hosting my services on there, which is, you know, a lot of data centers allow for small businesses, allow for organizations to actually have, they provide what, you know, maybe software as a service, platform as a service. So I am not bothering my head with the security of data. That has been outsourced to them, which is why they go through this, you know, this regulation, this data protection, so that at the end of the day, I go to them knowing fully well is that they will secure my data. And the, the good thing is they are doing a very, um, you know, they're doing a good job. We, we cannot have 100% secure, like I mentioned at the beginning, even if in Microsoft, yeah. um, they hacked, 
you know, at that level. So it simply means that regulation and compliance isn't really enough at the moment. Because the regulation, compliance, and all this risk management will always trail behind innovation. Right now, we're talking about AI. Now, I don't think there's any data center in Nigeria now that can host sort of like an AI data like, you know, that is secure, that, you know, uh, just, just sort of like what we have over there. But I'm sure that with um, uh, Mr. Ken as well and, and, you know, the data center ecosystem, they're probably putting servers and infrastructure in place to be able to secure these things. Uh, these things. And like uh, Mr. Emmanuel also said, uh, there's also cyber security as a service. Now, when you are providing the cyber security as a service to some of these organizations, you are making sure that they are secure. You are making sure that all the controls that you need to put in place are in place, and they are, you know, they are, they are, they are basically doing, uh, I think, for now, a, a, a fantastic job. So I think they are, they are probably a lot more secure than uh, we give them credit for. Um, so, Engineer Namani, uh, my last question to you, because I, I was told you had to fly, <laughs> is what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and data center uh, functionality? Sometimes um, artificial intelligence is come to stay. Um, it's not uh, currently. I was just uh, watching on CNN uh, earlier today that the European Union had just released a new set of policies to safeguard uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence, right? Uh, the US has also come uh, to indicate the same because um, one of the reports that was published by Gladstone uh, earlier this month is that potentially artificial intelligence may not only lead to some people being out of job, but could actually create a marginal, right? For those that are afraid of science. But irrespective of some of this, the reality is that the benefits of artificial intelligence far, 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 far outweigh the challenges or negative side of it, right? The benefit is just too enormous to be ignored. So it's something that has come to stay and will keep advancing. For that purpose, uh, data centers are today being redesigned to be able to take on uh, artificial intelligence applications. Totally um, uh, retrofitted to be able to handle it. Uh, but the technology exists, and companies like ours are trying to do that because we've done it in some other countries, right? Um, it, it's just here to stay, but it also means that uh, there is a need. Now, for Nigeria, rather than look at AI as the primary need for data centers, because uh, even the AI services are not being rolled out significantly here. The one that's probably more critical to us that we are currently lagging behind is Internet of Things, right? Because Internet of Things is already here. There are devices that is running on it. They all require low latency. So this is why we need edge data centers spread across the country. Even before we start building data centers for AI, which is definitely uh, hyperscale facilities, we currently are even lagging behind building data centers for Internet of Things, which is already here with us and is existing, right? So um, there is a lot that still needs to be done, but the country is in the right path, and this just means there's a need for future growth and opportunity in the space. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Box conferences, summits. Like Chigera said, everyone is involved in how we meet and how we can be safe online. I want to hear everyone's last thoughts on this. How do you think with everyone needing to contribute to being secured online and the potential it has for the data center market to grow in Nigeria? I start from the regulation <laughs> Uh, my question is, um, with so many people knowing, hearing from different conferences and talking talks, adverts on TV, but we can see quite a number of people have been hacked one way or the other before, and nobody takes time to read 
or even find out who was a cookie or was not a cookie and what it entails. So my question is what, you know, it falls on everybody. What are the last thoughts on what individuals need to do to enable the uh, um, data center market potentials to grow as an individual from the angle of policy? <laughs> Your question is very loaded, <laughs> and I think it has various dimensions, and I think it's also aimed at summarizing, bringing this uh, session to an end. So um, I'll try to keep it simple. So for the first one, about you know, I think it's about we do a lot of awareness creation. We keep talking about these issues, but at the end of the day, there's a part for us to play as you know, data subjects. We call ourselves data subjects when we're talking about data protection, but basically you and I. And if in a room such as this, we only have a handful of people that actually read privacy policies or terms. Okay, I'll focus on privacy policies because terms and conditions is a bit outside of my scope. But I'll focus on privacy policy because it's supposed to give you the information you need to be informed about how your own information is being used. Um, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we are not reading it. Um, yes, it's voluminous, but there is a way to send feedback to the organization whose policy you're reading to say, look, this is too voluminous. If everybody takes out time to send one email that says it's too long, eventually something will be done about it. If they don't do anything about it, you can report them to the commission. Because part of our regulation is that they should have a privacy policy. It should be clear, it should be simple and precise. So if you report to us, then we take it up and tell them to simplify it. But if they simplify it and you don't read, then, you know, there becomes another issue. So um, that's the, on the one part. Um, now I've forgotten the second part of your question. <laughs> Since you said it's loaded, yes. I don't want you to so unload too much. Okay, no Mr. Emmanuel, your last thought on the potentials of, from the angle of cybersecurity, what are the potentials of data center market growing in Nigeria from the cybersecurity angle? Okay, um, you know, people want to trust the centers to be able to deliver on their promises. So I'll also, I'll just say that uh, uh, more attention, or pay more attention to cybersecurity protocols, right? Yes, we pay more attention to cybersecurity protocols, and uh, which also includes compliance, and letting the populace know that, hey, we're in compliance with just as what we did that gave, gave us an edge in the market space. So that actually will help the uh, adoption and scalability of that of data center of that industry in Nigeria. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ivano. Mr. Ivan, your last spot on the potentials of the data center market growing. Would expect to organizations that gather these data and the organizations that I enforce uh, the protection of these data. Well I, I um I honestly think that um, um, when once the, there are strong regulations, when once um, compliance is good enough, um, and then, it, 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 you see, because um, uh, there's a flip side to this thing. Um, even with regulation and then, um, like the, the commission have done something fantastic, which is um, having DPCOs come to you, and the DPCO is expected to uh, assist you to meet the um, requirements uh, as stated under the law. The next other thing is how much are you doing yourself as data center to ensure that you have gone through compliance, um, you understand the regulation, and then you have implemented safeguards as will be advised by the DPCOs. Now, it's a very comprehensive law that has been made. The regulations are there and new things are coming up. When once um, data centers are able to provide this level of comfort, I believe um, more trust will be put on them. 
Okay. Now, on trust, Mr. Shea, on trust and technologies, new technologies coming up, what are your last thoughts? What are the potentials of these sectors in Nigeria going with respect to trust? Thank you very much. Um, you see, one, one of the things I've always, uh, I've always wondered is with all these regulations, all these data protection, I know a lot of organizations are doing all these um, ISO, you know, 27001 risk management. We still have, you know, issues with protecting data. It leads me to conclude that the problem must be with the human being, must be with the person, because of the way we think. Now, if you think about why we have this issue, even globally, you know, the internet is actually supposed to be secure by now. But you see, at the end of the day, it is about the human being. I'll give you, you know, in rounding up, I'll just give us, you know, maybe one or two examples. Now, if you think about even how, um, when we were younger, there used to be people called pickpockets. You know, so sometimes when a pickpocket wants to pick your pocket, he wants to, now, if I want to pick your pocket, I don't know where your wallet is. Now, what I want to do is, because I don't know where your wallet is, I want you to give me that information. When you give me that information yourself, which is, in cybersecurity, they call it victim-assisted, you know, um, um, fraud. You know, so what do I do? So in a gathering like this, imagine a situation where we have just finished, and I put up a very big sign outside that says, beware of pickpockets. What do you do when you say it? The first thing is, ah, the first thing is, by doing that, what have you done? You have given me the information that I, without you knowing that you are giving it to me. So that's essentially what happens online through social engineering and phishing. We have a lot of problems in Nigeria. Everybody is looking for a job. Everybody is playing bet Niger. Everybody. So once you get a text message that says, oh, you have won a bet that you did not participate in. And they tell you to go to a website and put in, you know, certain details. And oh, in order to get this 50,000 or 100,000 or 500,000, you need to put in this information, your name, your... And you see, you see a, even very educated people doing this. You know, you get all these, um, oh, we're delivering a parcel, parcel that you did not order. You know, you now get a message from a, a, a parcel delivery company. But before you can get the parcel, we need your name, we need your phone number, we need your this, and you are happily doing it. Now, you see, the fraudsters are very um, smart in that they do not use that information immediately. They wait for two, three, four, five weeks later, and then they use it. And then you are wondering how your information, how your data has been compromised, not knowing that you have also given it to them. And that is essentially what is happening. If you want to find out if you've been compromised anyway, because of the way we log in into the internet, into the internet there's a website called haveibeenpawned.com. Now, if you go in there, H A V E I B E E N P W N E D, just put your email. The email you usually log, use to log into, you know, uh, whether it is your social media. It will tell you all the sites that you have logged into and if, you know, your password has been compromised. Immediately change your password. Secondly, enable two factor on any application you're using. Two factor authentication. She asked a question at the beginning whose WhatsApp has been. A lot of people's WhatsApp, they have even been hacked and you don't even know. And it is very, very easy. Enable two-factor authentication so that when one factor is compromised, the other factor will serve as a safeguard. You know, and I always tell people that are practitioners as well, we should stop using SMS as two-factor. It has been it has been proved that you know this is not um, you know secure. Let's use you know more um, uh, secure like the, all these Google authentication, and if possible, we go passwordless as well. So I think in rounding up, I'll I'll put the effort on human. Maybe more awareness needs to be done for the human. You know, because one of the things we've seen, I, I was sitting down there, and somebody would ask me for you know my charger to charge the phone. Do you know that chargers now that have Wi-Fi is built into them, that when you connect and you are charging to your phone, everything you are typing, you are putting onto the person, and you don't know. There are also, we just get in there, we use it. I put, when you go to conferences, they give out flash drives, and they know, the hackers know the human psychology. So when you pick up a free flash drive, as you are doing, what's the first thing you do? You connect it to your laptop. And once you connect it to your laptop, that's it. You have, you have given them access. The same thing with free Wi-Fi. You know, everybody, when you come to a place like this, the next thing you are looking for is free Wi-Fi. So a lot of these things, we need to work on the human psyche. We need more awareness. You know, you might put all the protection, all the regulation, all the servers, all the firewalls. If the human is compromised, that's the end of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
I believe each and every one of us we uh, learned one or two things. Really, I, I didn't know my charger can be used as a I've learned one or two things <laughs> As in, they keep evolving on the ways to take from us. They always the DPOs, always the government regulation, always the data centers. Each and every one of us is actually responsible first for our safety online and offline. Um, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Comments to add? Okay. And then sometimes too, even when you are hacked, you don't even know that you have been hacked. About three or four years ago, I was let me say three or four years ago, technology mirror was hacked. And I didn't know. It is because we we signed an MOU with a group in the US, they call them syndicates. Syndicate, the syndicate content from Africa, the syndicate uh, content. Uh, across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And we're so excited when we signed that MOU with them because they were paying us in dollars for every of our content that they syndicate, and it was making the traffic to boom. And then last year, something happened. I complained to my uh, uh, hosting company, Google Host. The, sometimes the website will go down, sometimes it will come up, sometimes it will go I keep complaining to them and they keep just feed, trying to feed up with the website. It was later on I complained to my webmaster, I said, look, this is what is happening. Say that sometimes the website will trip off, sometimes it will come up. Not knowing that they've hacked into that website, during those periods that the website will go off, somebody somewhere was using it to trade on crypto because of the traffic. So they link they, they they taking advantage of that traffic and they were using it as what as a crypto website. I don't really know what was going on until the, my webmaster discovered it that look boy this is what is happening. So a lot of script on the website was changed. I mean myself I didn't even know but I was uploading content into it. People were still reading it, were still visiting the website, and it was also reading the content on it. Eventually, the webmaster was able to go around it and remove the script, which Google was couldn't even remove. They didn't even know that there was already a script on that website, and they were using to use that same technology mirror to trade on crypto. And which was a very serious offense. If yes, I have even got to know, which I didn't even know. So sometimes you can be hacked and you will not know. And the, the saddest thing that when they, when they hack you and you don't even know, it's even the worst part of it. Because a lot of things can happen. And that's why we actually need to be very, very, like as he like as said, the human factor of it. It's very, very important. Thank you. Apart from just uh, and secondly, apart from just the uh, human factor, of which I uh, just reacted to, I also recommend that there's you should put tools in place that helps you detect and respond against cyber attacks. Right. The little thing would prop up people to you know just go in and do anything. Yeah, I've received a lot of I mean, mails on my own email box. Now what I did was that I create a particular folder. Each time you call, I drop it there. Each time you call, I drop it there. Now, to anybody, there's every tendency that you would want to try to say, okay, let me go see what is done. And that is where the human comes into play. There is no engineering, there is no electronics, there is no AI that exists without a human uh, capacity involved. So is either you accept it 
or you don't want to accept it. Now, that is where our own personal intuition comes into play. Do I who would send SMS to you say you won? Yes, you have not participated. But there are some people who will go there and still do it and do gamble. Because all of these things are gambling. And in any situation where gambling is or gambling exists, there's every tendency that whether you will win or you will lose. Let's be truthful to ourselves. But that is where each person I mean, extent comes into play. And the awareness that we are having today are part of what gives us that uh, opportunity. But I can still tell you, amongst us who are seated there, some people will still receive an SMS after this session, after this forum, and they will still go ahead and still do that. But you see, it is not enough to get all these things together. It is better for you to sit down and articulate them and even rub minds together. Now let, let me just say this. Somebody who uh, is, wants to go into transport, unfortunately, he said, he felt, he felt that, okay, it was a business for him to do. Now, he did not consult those who were involved. Now, he went to get an higher purchase. Now, if there's a problem as we speak, as I speak to you now, that is bringing his BP so high. Now, and that is where the collaboration is, is, is essential. It is not that, okay, I know. There's also somebody who has gone beyond you, who has participated, who has experienced it, and which can tell you that at this point, too, this is where you should stop. So that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, so we have. The rest of the Malays developments in Africa. And based on what we've seen so far, it has seemed to turn a lot, like we talked about digital reality and MP exacted notes. But it begs the question now. Uh, is it that we've not done enough in the sense that the big players, uh, most African startups and companies depend on the big players like AWS, uh, GCP, and uh, Microsoft Azure. When you go around, just move around, you find that most companies here yeah, still depend on them. So the question now is for the panel is, is it that we're not doing enough in Africa? These developments, because I don't believe if if you cannot conceptualize and development, that is it's not development at all. So what is the problem now in Africa? Is that we're not doing so well to uh, possibly make the development so well? We are with the agree, the really big teams can only call and draw our interest. That's one. And number two, don't wait for us to report. Do the work yourself. If you have companies writing thesis, do you understand? And you want us to just allow. I mean, but if they know that you can sanction them or can correct them, they will be allowed to their responsibilities. So don't wait for us to report them to you. Please, on your own, try and check out this. Um, and restrain them from what they are not supposed to. That's just my But collaboration is key also. Let's have a whole channel and they give us a way to collaborate with you. If some of us don't mind to be important to you to get people who are doing wrong to get to, to, to be notified. Thank you. Everyone, whether you like it or not, you are already living in the digital economy. And uh, cyber attacks will be more. Whether you like it or not, it will be more. My advocacy would be that organizations should earmark more money for cyber security. What we see playing out today, many organizations, because the the, the, the benefit is not, is, is fluid. You know, it's not something you can hold. It's intangible. It's intangible. So, my advocacy would be that digital economy is here. A time is coming that you won't see Nera again. You won't see the real Nera again. For instance, now, if you go to, if you go to, if you go to bank now, right, and you tell them, okay, I, I, I want to withdraw 500,000. As a corporate, um, as a corporate um, um, account account holder, they will tell you I can't give you this much. That why don't you explore other other options? So 
more of your money. Are you damn now? We will be fluid. So, may God help us. It's just the way the world is. And what you just said is, if you actually even really look at it, the only country, all the companies you mentioned, AWS, Google, they're just American based. You see, the problem with us here, America has a structure. They have a, a structure in place that they promote innovation. So they don't care. It's here that, you know, when you have an idea, you can't even go, to, nobody can, nobody will fund you because we optimize for the downside. So by default, if you come to me and say you want to start a data center, I already know that we fail. So I, I optimize for the downside, I'm not going to fund you. But America over there, what they, that's why they have their VC, if you go to San Francisco, the VC, the, the, the venture capital, you know, is huge. They, they can fund you, they know, and then they have a, pl a, a, a long term plan. They don't care whether, that's why even Amazon didn't make money for so long, you know, until they turn profitability. They can wait. So it fosters the culture of innovation. They're able to create, but they're able to fail faster and, you know, create more things. That's why even all over the world, you see that a lot of these things, Tesla, is, uh, a, 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 have you seen uh, Tesla in Africa? No. Um, Starlink, have you seen them in Africa? No. A lot of these things are there because they have a culture of, you know, um, failing often and failing fast. And in the um, last comments that you made, you just, just made me remember certain things about, you know, um, education is very key in this part of the world. We need to train. What we've seen is that a lot of us here, when you, are, say, when you say you are an accountant, you just say, oh, I'm an accountant, I don't want to learn IT. When you say you are an auditor, oh, I'm an auditor. A lot of these things are crossing boundaries now that you have to call. An accountant needs to know how to read code. So, convergence yes, skills. A, an auditor needs to know how to read code. Otherwise, like for instance, we had a situation with, um, with a, a financial institution a long time ago where it is when you are in the technology field that you know that there's a difference between mathematics and accounting. So let's say there's a fraud, like something has happened and you are tasked with investigation for that fraud. One of the things you will see is that because of the way an accountant and an auditor will treat it, it's going to be different from the way a technology person will treat it. Let me give you an example. So if, if you build a, 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 an app, let's say a banking app that does funds transfer, okay, and then you discover fraud on it, say, um, the, the monies that are just you know going missing. An accountant will go in and they'll quickly segregate and say, okay, all the people that have zero balance, they cannot be, you know, um, suspects. Suspect. But you see, a technology person will see it and say, no, they cannot, they should be suspect. Why? There was a time that a certain bank they were doing a campaign and they just noticed that so many people were going to open. It was a zero balance, just open, zero balance. Now the person that built the app, remember that. Programmers and software developers are not accountants. So when you built it, when you are doing funds transfer, so let's say you have 10,000 naira, and you want to do a funds transfer from account A to account B, the, the code is supposed to say you cannot transfer more than the amount that you have. So if you have 10,000 that even though the, the programmer has put in a constraint that you cannot transfer more, but you see, you can actually transfer less than that, even if you have zero. So let's say I have zero balance, and I want to transfer 10,000 Naira to you, or I want to move money. If I do minus 10,000 Naira, minus 10,000 is less than zero. Guess what will happen? I will say, I will put your account number in there, and I'll say zero, minus, minus, and you will not get a debit alert. And the money will come to Now you'll be wondering how the money. An accountant will go in there and say, ah, no, but it's only a technology expert that will read the code, that will know that the constraints you are giving it is wrong. And that means that all the people with zero balance, because they just noticed that people were just rushing in a certain branch to open accounts because they had discovered that if I, all I will just tell you is, please sir, send me your account number. Of course, you will send it to me. The next thing is you get the debit alert. And the money will come to me because the code will do zero minus, minus 10,000, minus, 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 plus. And that's what would happen. And that was what. Thank you, Tech Test. So for, for us in the te technology space, even just as an awareness, we should also pay attention to that. Because that actually checks for vulnerability in your code, right? Just as uh, 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 just also said. So to, for, to your question, first is, I would like to classify this the data center under deep technology, 
right? I was in Egypt uh, some few days back, and I added my, my voice to that of the Egyptian government to say that it's high time we started adopting our technology, African pet technology in Africa. By Africans. Yes, it's our time. Yeah, I understand, oh, we have this notion of the white. Permit me to, to use that word. That what they build is 100%, it's perfect. We can do better. I will trust our technology. Yeah. Yeah. So, that actually brings the issue of, of trust. And per, per, permit me to also speak from the VC's point of view, right? Um, Guys who want to fund this deep tech technology, they are focus. And for us in Africa, we lack focus. We are put to pivot. Oh, we started, we want to build the data center, it costs XYZ amount and like that. Because we, we, we put in so many energy and we're not seeing revenue at the short term, we want to pivot or we want to start diverting funds. So once you come to university, I want to build a deep tech project. They're like, hmm, Africans, black. So if we are able to build trust and also know that our technology can scale, I think people will definitely want to uh, go from using AWS and Azure to what we are currently looking at. Thank you. To address your comments, we actually do have channels of communication. Yes, there's a dedicated number on our website, and if you call that number within working hours, someone will pick up, pick up the call and take your complaint. You can also send your complaints to a dedicated email that is info, I-N-F-O, at npc.gov.ng. And we receive a lot of complaints. But we do not only begin investigation based on the complaints that we receive. Sometimes we may pick up an issue from social media. For instance, um, I recall that there was an issue with JAM and one of their CBT centers where a young lady went to register for an exam. You know, he started sexually harassing the girl and she's a minor. So apart from the fact that you know what he's doing is a criminal offense on the fact that she's a minor, we want to look at it from a point of privacy. And we've been talking a lot about data protection. The protection part is quite, in my, in my opinion, is quite more established than the privacy part. The protection is what we've been talking about, cyber security, keep it safe and all that. But how about thinking about it from, uh, from the point of privacy? You give it to one person. If that person is going to share it with another person, you should know who they are sharing it with, and you need to give your consent for that. Or there needs to be some kind of lawful basis for that to happen. So you go back to this scenario now, you have this girl whose phone number is in the hands of this guy. He's supposed to use it for a different purpose. He's now using it for another purpose. We didn't wait for that lady to come to us. We're doing a lot of awareness. But not everybody is aware yet. But we saw that it was you know, a trending issue and we picked it up and we actually you know, started an investigation. And so this is just to portray the point that we don't always wait for complaints. We can't wait for complaints. If we pick up an issue, we will immediately start an investigation and we start working on it. Yes, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists for your time, for your insight, for your contribution. I know each and every one of us have learned one or two things. I know I have, and I believe you all have learned as well. Um, from the takeaways we all had, please keep it on your left hand, because I know the right is for Chin Chin, Fufu, Amala, okay. Please, don't throw it away. And like they all say, we started with monitor, and we finished with monitor. There's need for investment in cyber security. There's need for investment in new technologies. And there is need for investment in time. Every one of us should take our time before accepting those cookies on those websites, before signing up for those softwares or the 
chat GPT prompt websites. Quite a number of them are out there right now. Thank you very much to all our panelists. A round of applause for all of them. So, um, can we have like a photo session for the uh, speakers? And, uh, A round of applause once again for the panelists. A number of us were very honest because we've been hacked on our web, um, websites, WhatsApp, Facebook. Thank you for being honest. At least from there, you know Elias. He's a cybersecurity expert.